Sit back and let me tell you about a time that changed our lives forever and how I went from this to this and my road to recovery from this My name is Claire and I am a stroke survivor. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time you're watching this. And uh, welcome to a special uh, sit down uh, because we're going to tell our story. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name's Lee. And my name's Claire. And uh, about a year ago, something uh, very traumatic happened to this family, didn't it, Claire? Yes, it did. Change our lives forever. It did. So we thought we'd share our story with you and let you know how things are going now and uh, just share our story, really. <laughs> so, for those who don't know, um, Claire suffered a stroke a year ago. So, Claire, why do you think... You're ready now to tell your story because this is the first time really that both of us have sat down together to speak about this properly. Yes. Why do you think now is a good time nearly a year on? I think it's good to share your story, see if other people have been through the same thing, share your experiences, your highs, your lows. And I think it's good for us as well really because like I said a minute ago, we haven't really sat down and spoke about this properly. No, so. that's right. So just to give you a backstory, me and Claire have been together about 16 years now. I've been married. A lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> married for four. Before this, I'd never had, illness-wise, nothing. Fit as a fiddle. And then about two weeks before the stroke, uh, Claire suffered a really bad chest infection, didn't you? Yeah, that's right. And then, um, so we had to call an ambulance and everything. Uh, they come, took her to Queen Elizabeth Hospital, done chest x-rays and stuff, and said they thought it was pneumonia as they seen some fluid on the lungs. They said it was heart-related because I had water on my lungs, but apparently it was at the bottom of both lungs. And if that if that means something, sometimes that you have uh, something wrong with your heart, so that's why they wanted to investigate more. Uh, because of COVID and stuff as well, they said they didn't really need to keep it. They weren't too worried about anything. Was they just sent you home with some antibiotics. So uh, Claire was resting up for the week. And then on a Sunday was the first time we actually felt right, didn't you? And we went out shopping, Bexley yeah. Eve and stuff like that. Walked around Primark. You come home and felt a little bit tired. Yeah. And then we got to the day of the stroke. So... 25th of October, I think it was. Yep. First day of the half term for the children. They were both in bed. My daughter was nine at the time and my son was 12. And my husband was get downstairs getting ready for work. Weren't getting ready for work, it was half term. I was just potting around the house. That's right, sorry. That's all right. <laughs> I was just potting around the house, uh, tidying up the kitchen and stuff because I'd go up early. I, I usually go up early. Because of work. Claire likes to have a lane. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I must have woke up just about eight o'clock. Woke up, I felt a little bit warm, which is not nothing not normal for me. And I just felt to the point like I was sweating. Like, uh, you know, when you've been wrapped up in a cover and you can't get out of it, I was like that feeling hot. So I turned the fan on, sat in front of it for a bit and still just couldn't cool down and thought, right, I need to get myself to the bathroom and put some water on my face. So I went, got up and as I started walking, my left leg just gave way. The only way I can describe it is... Dead weight, literally just dead weight, couldn't control it or nothing like that. So somehow I managed to get myself to our bathroom. You come out of our room 
and then you go down three steps and to the left a bit and then up another step and then on the right hand side our bathroom so somehow I got there and then tried opening the door with my left hand as I'm left-handed and it just wouldn't open and work so I tried again and again it didn't work so then I decided well let me turn and go downstairs so as I turned to go down the stairs um, my leg must have gave way again and I just fell flat on my face and then I like literally pu tried pushing myself up and I couldn't so that's when I called my husband Lee and was like Lee Lee and he's like so I was downstairs and I said wash it up and I just heard Lee so I got to the bottom of my stairs and look, looked up and see Claire collapse on the floor and I just looked at her and I was like what are you doing on the floor, you donut? Because I thought she had tripped or fell or something like that because I didn't really hear nothing or anything like that. So I was like, what are you doing on the floor, you donut? Um, and started to walk up the stairs. Just as I got to the top of the stairs, Claire just went, well, we'll go away. And that's how her face was. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's funny because we're doing <laughs> fashions, but that's literally how it was. And I just thought, oh, no, she's having a stroke. And for some reason... I just remember the adverts from being a kid, that face, time and all that. Um, so that's how I knew. So straight away I shouted to our kids uh, for us to grab a phone. Um, while that was happening, what was you feeling? Again, I didn't know what was happening. I was hazy, like, in my head. Like, it was just, like, everyone else was around, but I didn't know what was going on. I just remember seeing my husband's face when he was coming up the stairs being white like a ghost like I'm talking pure white like Casper he was I've never seen him like it and as I said so I didn't realize what was going on around me so uh as I said I shouted for the kids to grab a phone they both come running out of the rooms with the mobiles I run uh, for the ambulance um and they asked me some questions and then one of the questions were get her to say it was something to do with loads of bees. Yeah, remember? bees, something like a buzzing bee. I, don't, I only remember the like, first couple. But it was loads of things to make to see if her face could do all that. And that obviously at the time, it wasn't. So I was saying no, and I said, and she's very slurry. Um, she's talking funny. And then Claire just looked up at me and went, why are you doing and I'm talking funny? And I was, I didn't want to scare her, I was petrified, and I didn't want to tell her she was having a stroke, so I said, I just think it's because you're really tired. But it was strange, because all Claire was saying to me is my legs gave way. She didn't realise anything else was going on. I sent our daughter down outside to um, um, show the ambulance where to go, and then Claire decides she wants to turn around and go to me, mid-stroke, I need to go to the toilet. <laughs> He does his face all the time. Oh, <laughs> um, yeah. So I remember, I just still remember being, again, I didn't really know what was going on around me, who was there, who wasn't, just hear voices. Um, I remember feeling very hot still and wanting to go to the <laughs> toilet. So I remember saying to Lee, Lee, I really need to go to the toilet. Take me to the toilet. So I had to physically lift Claire up because her leg was like tucked behind her back. Yeah, so say this is your legs. This is my left leg. And it literally was like that. And her arm was up like that and just could, like not, that. could not move. So I literally physically picked her up and dragged her five or six steps and sat her on the toilet. So then we're sitting there for 30 seconds to 40 seconds. And then she's going to me, Lee, I can't go. You're pressurising me. <laughs> but like, she's in the middle of a stroke and I'm pressurising her to go to the toilet even though she asked to go to the toilet. But we later found out, we didn't find out that when you're having a stroke. Um, that when you have a stroke, um, it actually stops you uh, going to the toilet. So after um, Claire couldn't go to the toilet, she then said to me, again, mid-stroke, take me back to bed. And I just thought, no, this is not a good idea. So I sat her down against the wall back outside the bathroom at the top of our stairs. 
And then um, Claire had no top on. I thought, obviously, the ambulance people are coming. So we need to get a top on her. So I put, got her night. He went to put a T-shirt on. Had to physically pull her arm through the thing because it just was not straightening through the arm sleeve. At to which point Claire was going, yeah, but what about my arm? I was like, <laughs> babe, I've pulled it through. Your T-shirt's on. Yeah, but what about my arm? And I was like, babe, it's on. Yeah, but what about my arm? Uh, by this, so all this had happened in the space of like three or four minutes, and I'm panicking because I don't know if she's gonna. She's just telling me she wants to go to sleep. So I run the ambulance back again, and I was like, please, can you tell me where where they are? Hurry up! I'm really scared. She's she's trying to go to sleep. She's trying to go to sleep. He said um, they're just coming up to the bottom of the road. So all in all, it was about eight minutes, but it felt like about three days. It was the most scariest eight minutes of my life, like, I've seen things in my work, I've seen people have fits and stuff like that, I'm usually very calm, but when it's someone that you love, um, and you see it, it is really, really panicky, so the ambulance people turned up, and funny thing was, one of the ambulance people was the man from two weeks ago, who came and Claire had uh, trouble breathing, so um, they come up, uh, do you remember much about the ambulance people when they come up? I don't remember up? nothing. So they come up, did all their sats and all that. And at the top of our stairs where the bathroom is, it's quite narrow. So the uh, people said they weren't going to be able to bring a trolley up to put Claire on. We were going to have to move her down the stairs and then they could put her on the trolley bed. So we were all discussing how we were going to do that. And I said, don't, don't worry about it. I'll lift her down and, and bump her down the stairs. So I picked Claire up. Now, obviously, by this time, she's sort of in and out of sleeping. So she's gone very dead weight. Also, the back of her leg, as we said earlier, is tucked up around her back and her arm's not moving. So she was in a very awkward position as well. So I went to slide her and we just thought, nah. So what they had to do was bring up some chair thing. There's three of us in a hallway that probably can fit one person. And Claire on the floor and a trolley seat <laughs> trying to scoop Claire. So I literally had to come behind and scoop Claire up and then we had to strap her down and then they bumped her down the stairs and put her in the back of the ambulance. I then had to come running up and grab whatever I could for Claire to go. But then I've had to then write a note saying this bag belongs to Claire just so someone could contact me. And then the ambulance people come out and, and because of COVID, I went, no one was allowed to go. While this is going on, I don't remember nothing of this, like being dead weight. I must have just fell asleep, contact or whatever it was. All I remember is being hot. And Lee told me after when I come home that Lewis was actually sitting there, my son, with a flannel and patting all around my body, trying to calm me down. I don't remember none of that. No. None of it. So um, I put Claire in the ambulance and uh, said to me, they're probably taking her to the Princess Royal, phone them in two to two and a half hours to find out what's going on, and drove off. So again, after all that traumatic experience upstairs and all that, to watch your wife just drive off in an ambulance, not knowing what the hell was going on, was one of the most scariest things ever. So I just went back in, phoned my mum, and then I just broke down crying. So I had a quick five minute talk with my mum, and then she said, come on, you've got to be strong for the kids and all that. Because they were off, they weren't at school or nothing. They've had a traumatic experience. They've just seen their mum go through this. Basically, pull yourself together and um, go off and do something fun. So uh, we just went off and went to Costa's for a cup of hot chocolate and something to eat. One of the first questions, though, from my daughter while I was in Costa's is, Mummy going to die? And it was so hard because I didn't know and I had to, I didn't want to lie either. So I had to sit there and say, let's hope not, let's keep our fingers crossed. So, while this is going on, we come home and that two and a half hours later has passed. I phone uh, the hospital. Princess Royal, and they said, yes, she's here, she's in A&E, Vsauce, uh, waiting to see the doctor. And I, 
they said she's in and out of consciousness and she was sleeping and stuff like that, so I couldn't speak to her or anything. And all I kept panicking about was this bag. Has she got the suitcase with her? <laughs> Just because it had a phone in there and because of obviously she weren't aware of what was going on, this needed to make sure that this suitcase was with her. That's all I could worry about. So they said, give us a call again in a couple of hours. Do you remember much about... I don't... And honestly, I don't remember one thing. I remember going to the ambulance, maybe being strapped in, and that is it. It's like I've lost a day of my life because I don't remember anything. So I run back about half past one and they said, no, she still hasn't been seen yet um, and all that stuff. And then I got a phone call about half past three to say they're moving her over to King's College Hospital in London. So to give them a call in an hour to an hour and a half to find out what's going on. They Did they say why? They didn't say why. They confirmed that there was a stroke. But they said Kings was a specialist hospital and they moved it over. So then an hour passes by and I phone up uh, Kings College Hospital. And I'm trying to find out for an update on uh, my wife, Claire. Can you tell me what's going on? So they said, they went, no, sorry, she's, she's not here yet. And I said, oh, she's coming from the Princess Royal well, no, she's not in our system. I said, all right, well, I'll phone the Princess Royal. There might be a delay or whatever. So I phoned the Princess Royal. Mm. Uh, Hi, I just want to update on my wife, Claire. Uh, what's going on? Oh, no, she's gone to Kins. No, I've just phoned Kins. She's not there. Well, she left here ages ago. So I was like, where's my wife? <laughs> like, <laughs> Kins saying they've got no record of her. You're saying she's gone. Where the hell is she? <laughs> like... What, she popped to McDonald's or something yeah. on the way to Typhoon or something? Like, where's my... And it was weren't an hour until Kins then phoned me to say they had they had got her. So, again, that was another scary point because I just know my wife's driving around London somewhere after suffering a stroke. Hadn't been able to speak... The last time I spoke to her was 8.30 that morning. The last time I had a, a normal, proper conversation with her was about 10 o'clock the night before on the Sunday night when she was with it. So you got to think, I hadn't really spoke to her properly in 15 hours and I just haven't got a clue what was going on. And then you had like my mum ringing you. Yeah, I had all the family. That I had to, and I'm just saying there's no news yet. There's no news yet. Then finally, about half past seven, quarter to eight, I got a call from a doctor, a lady doctor. She was, um, she was quite nice, actually. She explained who she was and she said... Um, your wife suffered a stroke, and I said, yeah, I'm, I was aware of that. She said, unfortunately, we couldn't get the beta blocker to in, in time. Firstly, because she'd spent all morning at the Princess Royal, and they didn't have the facilities to do that. And Kins only had one specialist team that could perform the procedure to put the beta blocker in, and they had been tied up all afternoon uh, with another patient. So she said, well, I'm really sorry we didn't do it, but she said, to be honest with you, from the time that she left your house to the time she arrived at King's, even if they had done, done it, there was a, a very high percent chance that it wouldn't have worked anyway. But she was very apologetic. And I said, look, don't worry about it. Is she breathing? And they said, yeah. I said, well, that's the main thing. So um, that was that. And that was the that was the first day and the first night, really. So then move on to this next day. Do you... So I don't remember, as I said before, anything that's gone on like in between. The only thing I remember I start, well, I must have started coming round or whatever, waking up a bit, was, must have been that night. I don't know because I didn't open my eyes. I just remember hearing voices and them saying, Claire, like, can you hear me? Like, how are you feeling? Um, what's your name? Date of birth? What hospital are you in? And uh, and then I just remember saying to her, "I'm tired. I feel tired because I did. I it's another extreme. Like you feel tired. You know, everybody feels tired. Yeah, for their life. But this is extreme tiredness, like fatigue, tiredness. Like you haven't slept for years. And then they're saying, "Well, what about?" And I was making a laugh because every time I like she kept asking how I was, I just kept saying tired. So she went, "Well, apart from feeling tired, how are you feeling? Do you understand what's happened?" I remember her saying about I've got to have a head scan 
and that I had had a stroke. But again, I was just in and out and just tired and wanted to sleep. So, yeah, the next time I remember was properly was about around about 11, maybe 10 or 11 the next day, which is the Tuesday. And then she came in. And she said, hi, introduced herself. I can't remember her name, Doctor Who or something. And then... Um, then no, I got that doctor. <laughs> <laughs> then some nurses come in and they introduce themselves. Um, I wanted to get out of bed because obviously I've been laying in bed. And they was like, I, I, I didn't even know the extent I was at. And they was like, no, you can't get out of bed. Um just sit there, have a drink, have something to eat. And then the nurse come in and she just chucked me this phone and like I gave her this look and she went, oh, your husband's been ringing. He must have been getting on their nerves or something. Yeah, they was like, he's been ringing all night and all morning. Can you please talk to him? And that is the first time that I heard his voice. And I was so emotional. But the funny thing was, from this end, the phone ran and it come up wifey. And I thought, oh, here we go. She's all right now. I'll be able to speak to her. And then I just heard, hello, this is nurse so-and-so. I'm going to pass you over. I've got your wifey. I'm going to pass you over. And then it got passed over. And I went, hi, babe. And the first thing was, Lee, I've had a stroke. (laughs) (laughs) And I was like, I know you have, babe. I was there. (laughs) (laughs) Can you come up and see me? So I said, okay, no problem. Right. Pass me back to the nurse. I could find out all the ward and all that. Did that. Because no, I'd actually forgotten, believe it or not, to, how to text and how to write like write a text and to ring on my phone. I literally looked at it and it was like looking at a blank screen. I knew it was a mobile, but I just could not remember how to text, how to get into my messages, how to call, nothing. So a lovely nurse said, oh, here, I'll do it. So, yeah, I spoke to him, yeah. asked him to come and see me. So, well, we don't drive, so I've travelled up by train and it's about a 45-minute journey. Got there. Because uh, of COVID, again, they was only allowing one person, no children, for one hour, and you had to book your slot. So I said, up, I'll be up between, uh, I think it was three and four. Got there about quarter past three, walked in, expect to see Claire just sitting up in bed, feeling a bit groggy. But I got there and it was oxygen mask through the nose, blood pressure machines on, something on the heart, some blanket electro vibrating things on the legs to keep the <laughs> to keep the legs going and stuff. And she was asleep. So I woke her up and she was just like, Lily. I went over, gave her a kiss, said, oh, you gave us a scare, you wally. Um, told her how much I loved her. And what did you say? You just went to me, like, you said you loved me too, mm, back yeah. and all that stuff. And then you just sort of said... Uh, that I was tired. Yeah, please stay with me, I'm tired. And Did, then, Oh, yeah, please don't leave me. Yeah, please don't, don't leave me. Then within a minute and a half, she was back to sleep. <laughs> so I travelled, waited... All that time to see her. <laughs> Travelled over an hour and saw her for about four and a half minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I did sit by the bed for about another five minutes and then I said to the nurse, is she going to wake up soon? They said, probably not. Her body and her brain has been through so much. She needs to rest. So I said, look, just tell her I love her and I'll see her again tomorrow and then left. And then I think I got a phone call from the nurse to pass the phone back over to you about four hours later. Yeah, something like that. I remember waking up before this (laughs) and obviously thinking that he's still going to be sitting there. And I see the nurse and I was like, where's my husband? And I was so upset because I wanted him to wake up and obviously didn't realise how tired I was and how much I slept. I wanted him to be there. I just wanted him to get in my bed and just lay there and not leave. I actually made him, believe it or not. (laughs) Bring up his dirty sweaty <laughs> t-shirt, t-shirt. sweaty t-shirts to have, so I could smell him and just have him. And I honestly did lay it on me and just 
sleep with it because I missed him that much. And yeah, so not much happened that day. I had a lot of nurses saying to me, oh, you are looking a lot better than you did. Uh, like yesterday, and then you're looking at them thinking, who are you? Yeah, who <laughs> like, are you? Because so a lot of them were like, oh, hi, how are you? And you look so much better. And I'm just like, oh, okay. And I'm just going along with it, saying hi. And then, and then they was like, uh, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish I could have asked what they meant or how bad I was. Because I honestly have not got a clue. So, yeah, the doctor then come in later that day. No, this is now the Wednesday, isn't it? No, it was the Tuesday first. And then she went, oh, like, do you remember what's happened? Do you know what's happened? So I said, yeah. They said, yeah, um, you've had a stroke. So I said, yeah. They went, oh, yeah. So you've been, and obviously explained what they said to Lee, that they couldn't get to the beta blockers in time. So they said, I have got a blood clot on my brain that they're going to keep an eye on. Um, and that I'm going to have to have some scans to make sure it's not getting any bigger. Um. And then she said, um, oh, was anyone come and spoke to you about your heart? So I was like, no. And they were just asking me that I'd been in hospital before and what that basically was for. Anyway, so then she goes, oh, um, so we think that your heart is the one that's called the clot and then obviously gone to your brain and caused the stroke. So I said, okay, right. So how, what, 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 my heart, but what are you telling me so it's wrong with my heart? And she said, yeah, you've got heart failure. And I was just like, what? And then she was like, yeah, because honestly, before this, I didn't take it seriously, like not heart-wise, but stroke. When someone says stroke, automatically, well, I did anyway, think older people, then that never could happen to something, someone like me. Because like this time last, Claire was 33 years old. So she had the stroke of 33. Unless someone's severely ill, you don't really hear of people that age having having a stroke. And then, yeah, so I didn't take it seriously. So then she said heart failure. And my mum has got heart failure. A different kind of what I've got. but So I kind of see it, but I was kind of like, wow. It was so much to take in at the time. So she said, right, yep, you've got heart failure, whatever. You need to do this test, that test. I don't remember 100% because, again, I was still in a haze of what's going on. So, yeah, that was like two days later or the next day, whatever it was. And then another two days later, they come back to me and they said, oh, yeah, we've got something else to talk to you about. And then I was just like, well, throw it at me. I've just been had a stroke and I've just been told I've got heart failure. What else can you give me? Like, that is going to shock me. So then they went, well, uh, you've got diabetes. So I was kind of like, okay. And I was like, yeah. They didn't really say much about it, apart from that someone will come around and talk to you about it. Um, Because I think at that time it wasn't as important to them than obviously the stroke and the heart. And my God, let me just say, if you have got diabetes, then you are a warrior. Yeah, so that was the first week. (laughs) So within the week, Monday was the stroke. Found out by the Wednesday that Claire was in heart failure and only 20% of her heart was working. And then found out on the Friday that she now got type 2 diabetes. Now, the funny thing, I say it's funny, the thing is with a stroke, obviously it affects people's memory. Still now it affects Claire's short-term memory. But because of COVID, no one could go up to see Claire. So then I'm trying to speak to Claire. She's in a haze and tired and does not have got a clue what the doctors had said. The nurses, bless them, didn't know what the doctors had said. And because of COVID, the doctors were super busy. So it was taking days for this information to get back to me of what the next stages were and all that stuff. So anyway, all that stuff happened. And then how long was that kid for? About three and a half weeks, wasn't it? Mm, yeah. Yeah, like so that. they moved her about a couple of wards of kids for about three and a half weeks. And then... Moved. Before that, though, because um, yeah. after... I think I'd been there probably about two or three weeks by then. 
And if you can imagine, I was still at King's, but I was going here, there and everywhere. Obviously, couldn't see my husband, couldn't see my mum. Obviously, you could talk on the phone, video call, but it's not the same as having some. You just want sometimes I just wanted a hug. Just wanted a hug. I wanted to see my babies. I just wanted to hold them. So I rang up Lee one day. I just having a down a day and I said, I've had enough. And he said, what do you mean? I said, I'm, that's it. I'm walking out of here. I'm coming home. <laughs> I don't know how I thought I was going to get home. Because all I had on me was the jogging bottoms, the top I had on. Um, and I had no shoes, no money, nothing. And not just that, at the time, she could barely walk. She was being supported in a walking frame and had to be moved around by the nurses to shower. Other than that, she was in bed. So not, she's sitting there worrying about how she's going to go because she ain't got no money on her suitcase. She couldn't physically get out of bed. <laughs> so I don't know how, unless she would have nicked the bed and rolled out with an electric bed or something, how she would have even got up to walk out. Sorry, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I was like, I'm last year, and Lee knows what I'm like. Put my mind to something. I do it. Like that's my decision, mate. End of. So he's then rang the ward up and spoke to one of the nurses, <laughs> being like, I'm her husband, whatever, Claire Parks, and then said, She's going on one. Like she's gonna leave. She's threatening to leave. Do not let her leave. She needs to stay, please. So <laughs> For about 20 minutes after that, he's rang me back. And I'm not joking, a nurse did come over, actually, to, to make sure that I was okay <laughs> and I weren't putting nothing on to go. I just said to him, oh, my husband's been stupid. <laughs> the thing I'm worried about is even though Claire's memory was and is affected, she's still classed as, as, still classed as being sound mind. So if she really wanted to discharge herself, there's nothing hospitals could have done. And that's what I was worried about. I felt like at the time, from a personal point of view, she shouldn't have been allowed to have control of her say-so for the first couple of weeks while her her brain was rebooting. I still think sometimes now she shouldn't have say-so because <laughs> it's not properly rebooting. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> he makes a lot of the decisions. Only because you struggle to, but we'll get all into that later. But I was just worried. If she wanted to say no, give me the forms to sign, I'm going home. Don't, there's, legally, there's nothing they could have done to stop it. That's why I'm on the ward. So anyway, so as we said, we was in the kid for about three and a half weeks, then uh, moved over to Lewisham for about another three and a half weeks. Again, it was just not much to go on because we're just going to move on with some other things in a minute. But uh, the in between was just test after test, test after and, test. The OT come and visit you sometimes. The physio didn't know they were rehabbing you on your leg. Um, so there's this one night I do want to bring up uh, as it comes to memory before we move on to the other things we want to talk about. So they gave Claire some uh, tests. So it's a bit like oh, no. some information and some questions. <laughs> it was like a TV guide. And it was four channels and it was saying um, what time things were on. And then the questions were like, what time's the movie on Channel 4? But the way it was wrote down, it was like Channel 3, Channel 4, Channel 8, Channel 10. So there was only four channels. So one of the questions was, how many channels are there? So I was like, right, babe, how many channels are there on the sheet? And she went, 10. So I was like, no, babe. I went, how many channels are there? So she went, 10. And I was like, no, babe. <laughs> channel 3, Channel 4. Channel 8, Channel 10. How many channels are there? 10. I was like, no, babe. And she was like, yeah, there's 10. Look, 3, 4, 8, 10. 10 channels. <laughs> no, Claire. How? And because I didn't understand how her brain was working, I then started getting frustrated because I thought she... We're a jokey couple. thought she was joking really did so what i think i said how thick are you at one point didn't you, i yeah i think he said oh you can't be that stupid you, know, you can't on. be that thick how many channels are there 
And I think we went through it for about 45 minutes. And then I think you got there in the end. I don't think I actually no, I I realised the answer. Yeah. I just think I was like, just take it. <laughs> so that so what we went so after about the seven and a half weeks, Claire didn't come out of hospital. Now, when you think they say, yeah, it's home time, come home, you think that's it, yeah, great, everything's done and all that stuff. No. As the doctor said to me, Claire's coming home because she's medically stable to be in her house. So coming home really is where the recovery and the journey's begun really, hasn't it? Yeah. So sorry I got to take my glasses. For me, in this and I sound a bit selfish or whatever, the hospital was the easy bit. Yeah. This has now been the hard bit. So we're gonna break down all three bits of Claire's condition and explain what it's like living with each condition um, on a day-to-day basis, just so you can build a bigger picture. So first of all, we're going to start with the stroke. Uh, On the outside, physically, a lot of people, doctors and nurses, get like, are like, wow, because of how young I am and how I am on the outsides. I look fine. I look um, okay. I don't even look like I've had someone who's had a stroke or whatever. But it's all in the insides. Mentally, physically. Emotionally. Emotionally. um, All in the insides. And not just on me. My family too. Day-to-day living, for me, is... Let's hard. start with the physical, because... I you're... don't have... Which I didn't say earlier in the video. I don't have no sensation in your or left feeling side. in my left side at all. That's from probably shoulder all the way down to foot. Yeah, can't feel this hand. I know that it's there... It's so hard to explain. People have asked me, like, what does it feel like? My kids have asked it. I know it's there, and I know that it's moving and whatever, but I just can't feel. That's so, the same with your foot, isn't it? When yeah, you're my left side's at yeah. that, yeah. So when you're walking, you know you've put your foot down, but you can't feel that you've put your foot down. Yeah, or... and say, for instance, a couple of months ago, my husband spilled, or my kids spilled some, a drink on the floor. Now, if you think you usually would feel it on your foot and be like, oh, it's wet on the floor and I didn't and I slipped and lucky enough I was next to the sofa and like fell onto the sofa but before you think we really made it out we did wipe it up but you know you still got the wet sensation on the wooden floor usually you'd still feel oh that's a bit wet or that's a bit cold when we did not feel it but obviously Claire couldn't feel that and slipped and it yeah so I didn't it's that they're there so now I've got to make sure like, I'm self-aware of things a lot more, like walking-wise, um, stuff on the floor, because, as you know, kids can leave stuff about, um, sharp these things, cooking, hot water. I have to do everything, obviously, with my right, make sure, getting in the bath or shower. Uh, cooking-wise, um, I can't cook in... When my husband's not around, because one because they're physically bit of the burning, but now we're gonna as we said we're gonna now move on to the mental, me, not mental she's mental, but the uh, the brain side of things. Yeah. So with the cooking, Claire would forget if something was in the oven, or even the other way around if it was in the microwave and it dinned, she would forget that it had dinned and then it would go cold again. Or as we said, if it was left in the oven, then it obviously could burn. Um, so, yeah, at the moment, Claire's not allowed to cook um, unless, not just if someone's around, it doesn't just necessarily have to be me. Um, the washing machine when Claire first came out, you just got to use that, hadn't you? Oh, God, yeah. And you do use that generally quite well. Sometimes you repeat the cycle, don't you? Yeah. You've got one. But overall, you've got really good with the with the washing machine, haven't you? 
Yeah. Uh, Short term memory, especially when Claire's tired. Yeah. It's a no go. We can have the same conversation three or four times a day sometimes where I've given Claire some information or she's told me some information but hasn't stored it. So she might t- two hours later go, oh, by the way, babe, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah, I know, babe. You told me a couple of hours ago. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. Um, Obviously, when Claire gets tired, a bit like now, you see, earlier on in the video, so we've been going... A half hour to 40 minutes, Claire was very chatty. Claire's now very quiet. Because just thinking and recalling things has now made Claire tired because her brain's working in overdrive to to get what it needs to do and try and pick up the information you can. And as we said, it just looks, Claire looks <clears throat> what we say the normal person is. But to sit here for the 40 minutes that we've sat here so far is probably like us thinking for a week. Is the best way I can explain it. My point of things like that, like now, we've been going how long? Forty minutes. Yeah. And I feel exhausted. Like honestly, probably after this, I could have two hours sleep. That's another thing. Going and moving on. Claire's on a lot of medication, but sleep wise, Claire is now probably awake, and we're nearly a year on, six to seven hours a day. When she first came out of hospital, she probably could only last about four hours a day. Now, again, a lot of people think, oh, we just lay in the bed all day. No. As we just keep saying, just to be up, doing things, having the environment of the noise of, like, the TV or the washing machine going around, noises from outside, all that um, sensory stimulation, there's lots for Claire's brain to process. It makes her exhausted. So Claire's routine when I'm at home usually on a weekend is she'll wake up, she'll be awake for a couple of hours, probably like two hours, sleep three or four hours, awake for another couple of hours, sleep for another two to three hours. Sometimes she'll wake back up, sometimes she won't, and it'll be a night. Again, also where so where we've had a scan at the beginning of the year, Claire's now got a legion, which is a scar over the frontal lobe. Now, frontal lobe controls emotions. On the right-hand side. On the right-hand side. And the frontal lobe controls emotions. Claire is now very impatient. Claire is now very tunneled, vision and, and focused, and very snappy. So now we're going to jump on to how it affects us. As a husband, it's very hard sometimes to be emotionally connected with Claire because she was snap at. On a, on a dime then straight away she's realised she's snapped she's very apologetic but it still hurts that the person you love will snap at you and it's really hard because I understand it's not clear I understand she doesn't mean it but I've still got the feeling of it happening Claire's also finds it hard to read how other people are feeling at the moment don't you mm. cutting if you feel wrong I'm just giving my opinion so if I'm a bit moody or I'm tired and Claire won't pick up on that and then Claire will talk to me and ask me to do something that I might be like, I'll do it, do it tomorrow. Why? Because I'm exhausted, I've come back from work or whatever. Oh, but I want you to do it now, Rob. And then that can cause arguments. I always say, and you hate this term, don't you? The day Claire had a stroke is the day I lost my wife. And in a way, for me, it's like I'm grieving for my wife. And it upsets Claire because... She... Okay, <laughs> Sorry. I don't want to ugly cry. <laughs> you couldn't ugly cry, you're beautiful. <laughs> but yeah, I hope... Claire knows how she was before. I hate and, this saying. And knows how she is now. And knows how she wants to be. So it must be so hard for Claire to wake up knowing... And uh, it is hard to say, but I've also got to say over the last year, there's been so much improvement to how it was eight, nine months ago to how it is now. It's so much better. It's so mentally draining on us both, but it is so much better. And it can only get better. They say stroke can take anything between one to five years to recover from. Yeah, physically, it's a lot. I have to take in 
He said, not for my confidence, for sure. Um, it's put a lot of reliability on my husband and so and my family and his family. Um, he's um, doctor appointments. I ha because of my memory of can't remembering things and that my husband has to take it all in so he has to take time off work so that's keeps forgetting my name's my husband <laughs> <laughs> my name's Lena <laughs> uh, <laughs> I never call you Lena until you're in trouble yeah exactly um so yeah we um oh, my mind's gone sorry uh, medical appointments yeah medical about. appointments so my husband has to do all that my medication my husband has to sort all so that. So Claire is on close to 60 tablets a week just to keep her breathing. So I've said if I ever want her to knock her off, then she knows if her tablet box is empty, <laughs> then she knows what's going on then. <laughs> so it's such a big thing, like thick as thick and mentally, it's knocked me for six, my confidence. I'm under counselling. Claire used to be quite a social person. Like on a weekend, we'd get up and go shopping. Love like I think, not socialising in the pub and all that stuff. That's my type of thing. But like being around people in cafes and stuff, it takes a lot of planning for Claire to just to go and pop ten minutes up the road near where we live to go to the cafe or something. Um, Claire likes to go at quiet times now because there's too many people about. Can't stand it. Can't stand it. It's, one, it's a sensory overload, but two, she then starts thinking everyone's staring at her. How she gonna explain if someone says why you're walking a bit funny or or why you got all blank and stuff? So it's just easy for her to stay in, which was not clear at all before. So yeah, that on that side of thing, and with the walking funny, um, cause when I was in hospital, I didn't realise until actually my husband picked up on it, and when I was walking, I was veering to the left. But I didn't realise it. So he kept telling me, and I was like, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. And he literally like, recalled me one day, and I looked back on it, and I was like, actually, I am. And I spoke to the nurses and physio people about it, and they said, yeah, it can happen because of like what's happened with the stroke can affect you. And uh, and what basically what they've told me now is um, it happens more now, don't it? Uh, when I'm tired. Um which is all the bloody time. <laughs> <laughs> um, that I will end up veering. I don't personally realise. Sometimes I feel a little bit wobbly, but genuinely I don't realise I'm doing it. And sometimes I don't even realise to the point that Lee will be like, Claire, you're walking into the road. So again, she could walk off into the road and not realise, trip down the curb because she can't feel it on her left foot, or just walk and with a car coming because she's not realised that she's doing that. So, again, even just to go out for a walk has to be supervised by someone. <laughs> Kids or myself or whatever, it just does. to make sure. Um, so, I've got a walking stick. I don't want to use it. I hate it. But they've told me that if I do long distances, you have to have your stick. that I have to have my stick with me, especially when I'm tired as well. Um, I have got the attitude like it's not gonna beat me. Like I, you're not gonna make me walk with that stick the rest of my life. I am going to get back to walking on that straight and narrow. Exactly, and that's the attitude we need. We went out last week or the week we went before, and we went out in the rain and for a walk. And if we're walking uphill, she's like, "Could have to give me a rant <laughs> if I slip uh, on a leaf." Yeah, yeah, <laughs> even that. Like silly things like that, I have to be supervised. Yeah. Right, heart failure. Heart failure side of things. So, long story short, uh, long, well, I can't get my words yeah. out now, I'm getting tired. Uh, long story short. Yeah, long story short, they told me that only 20% of my heart was working. Um, Did tests uh, in Lewisham, didn't they? Yeah. Um, bubble echo that is horrible by the way um and they said that i've got a hole in my heart but apparently when your 
a baby, jump in Lee if I get it wrong, yeah. um, you have a flap and when you're born it's supposed to close. Um, but my one hasn't. And they think that the clot, whatever it was caused, has gone through this hole and then gone up to my brain. So I believe you had the heart failure first, but obviously we was unaware of it. I could have had it for years and not realised. The clot's formed in the heart, shot across the heart because the gap wasn't closed. It's shot straight out of the heart, through the uh, artery or vein or whatever leads up to your brain, and then bam in the brain, bam, stroke. So originally we thought stroke come along in the heart. She went into heart failure because of the stroke, but it sounds like that she was in heart failure, which caused the stroke. Yeah. So, um, again, she's on tablets for that. So, she's now, you're around about 38% working now, aren't you? A year mm. on. What? Uh, 40. Sorry, so 40% working. So, it's gone from 20. 27, I think. It's gone from 20% to 40 odd percent. What they class as a, work, um, a healthy heart is anything over 50%. So, you're quite close to that now. But there's still moments you have, isn't there? Like walking upstairs sometimes, hills and stuff like that. We can get a bit out of breath and stuff. Uh, going long distance, you have to stop to rest, don't you? A couple of minutes just to get your bearings and your breath back to then be able to move. But if the tablets were stopped being taken, then it would deteriorate quickly. So even though it sounds like it's a good percentage, which is a quite a good percent, that is only because of the tablets couple of days off the tablets and it would drop straight back down and maybe stop. So it's tablets for the rest of your life, really, isn't it? Yeah. So. And with the hole in the heart, they said that people can live with it like that, but with mine, because of uh, the clot, they think the clot, they want to close it. Just in case another clot formed and then the same thing would happen again. So... And so um, I'm now under Kings with that, ain't I? Yeah, we're just waiting. Waiting to hear from them uh, to about closing the hole. But again, because of COVID, everything's just been put back so long. There's so many things we're waiting on. And we're just on waiting this because of COVID. Right, so now uh, we're going to move on to diabetes. Now, this is the bit you're struggling the most with at the at moment. At the moment, yeah. Because Claire's trying to get her levels um, stabilised. Um but we're having to try different um, medication because she was on metamorphine, but that made her really, really sick where she stopped eating and drinking for nearly a month and was rushed to hospital back for a week in January uh, on my birthday just to, just to make the year go really well. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. I'm going to go back to hospital for a week. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you dropped five stone. Yeah. In, so she come out of hospital mid-November, went back into hospital January the 12th, and by then she dropped five to five and a half stone. Um, so they stripped back all medication and started again. So she tolerated all the other medicine, um, but we believe, and I think the doctors also believe it was the metamorphine that was making a six, which controls diabetes. So then she's now on a different tap with it, but starting from the low dosage to increase just to make sure her kidneys can go with it so it's not helping to stabilize out the levels so what's what sort of pain do you wake up with on so, a daily basis yeah as i said earlier if you have diabetes whatever diabetes type one or type two you are a warrior you really are and that people think oh yeah diabetes i was one of these people I have diabetes my mum's got it yeah, my dad, you just think it's an injection. Yeah, you just think, just, oh, yeah, whatever, diabetes, yeah, and all this stuff. It is so hard. It is horrible. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. I suffer, obviously, really high blood sugars in the morning. They can be really high, can't they? Yeah. Um, I'm still new this to this. It was a year, but I say I'm new. Because of the stroke in the heart, diabetes got pushed down on what they wanted to try and help support with. So really and truthfully, we've been, again, as I mentioned about the metamorphine, but seeing diabetic nurse and sort of like your dietary requirements and your level for only about a month now, really, hasn't it? Because, no. Excuse me. Because everything was so focused on the heart and the stroke. So 
in a way, we are very new to this diabetes thing. So, sorry. So, um, yeah, with the I suffer with really bad pains. Pains in where though? My feet, uh, especially, and my arms and hands. And the only way I can describe it, like what it feels like to me, is you know that sensation you get in the winter um, when your feet are freezing. Uh, or like after you've played in the snow or whatever and they get that pain of like shooting pain in your hand or feet and you're like oh I need to put some socks on or I need to get to a radiator and it's that pain constant all the time could be from the minute I go to um, bed the minute I wake up and the only thing I found with me I have to now wear socks all the time that to me helps me. You don't take it away completely, but it helps. So in the summer, I was walking around in like dresses and had socks on. Big fluffy socks. <laughs> like winter <Yeah>. socks. <laughs> but it helps me. If that helps me, then that. And I know it's my blood sugar that I need to control it and get it down. And that's what we're trying to work on at the moment. So they've obviously got exercise. Because I've got to watch my um, weight. Because of the diabetes and the heart. And the heart, because obviously you don't want to put too much pressure on my heart. So now I have to take do that, and then that's another tablet I have to take now, yeah. is cholesterol tablet. They also didn't want you to exercise, but there's certain exercises you can't do. So I'm kind of just downloading an app or speak to a personal trainer. Because of the hole in the heart, if she then exercises too vigorously and puts too much blood through, that can cause a heart attack. A clot. Or a clot. So then... We've got to wait to speak to a special heart rehab ex exercise team to give us the right exercise support. So, again, that's what we're waiting on. So, as you can see throughout this video, everything's sort of intertwined with each other. And it's just waiting on a lot of things and stuff like that. Uh, anything else you want to say about diabetes? Yeah, and I'm oh, no, not diabetes. And I, I'm on blood thinners as well um well it was supposed to, be supposed to be for like six months or whatever no six weeks after oh, sorry. You come out not six months babe and then you're then meant to go on to wolverine or something like that which is an oral tablet but again because of covid things keep getting pushed back pushed back so claire's now been injecting blood thinning out once a day into her tummy now for nearly a year now and this is what this is the result this is what i have to live with day and day. i hate it So without bruising. And that I mean that is all around my stomach every day. Because we can't inject that into the thighs because if we don't put it in the right place, so they've said the tummy is the safest area for it. And I hate needles. I can't see needles going into skin and all that. So nine times out of ten, bless her, our daughter has to come and inject. And again, that's what we're saying going back to the psychological things on, on our kids. A 10-year-old yeah. has to come and inject her mum every night. And before, if anyone says anything, she wants to do it. She wants to help mummy out and all that, but it's just, it's hard because, in a way, it's took a bit of their childhood away as well because, again, where Claire's recovering and has to sleep or gets exhausted or not, Claire used to chase the kids around the house and be the tickle monster and have water fights inside, which I weren't too happy about, <laughs> and stuff like that. But now Claire's so exhausted or can't because she, if we get water on the wooden floor, she could trip over and not feel and stuff. So it takes the fun away. As I said, everything has to be planned and planned and planned again. Like, how has it affected you emotionally and physically? Overall, I'm. He's broken. He inside. Won't, <laughs> he won't admit. He's so tough. He's got this tough exterior that he feels like he has to be strong for everybody else. And because me. while all this is going on, I also got quite a stressful full time job. I work in a special needs school as the behaviour lead. So it can be quite physical on days, and the students can turn quite violent. So I have to deal with that on a daily basis. Then I have to come home and Claire's having a bad day. I have to help support Claire and then I have to cook dinners and stuff like that. And now we can't sit down and have a normal conversation about bills or whatever because Claire's not understanding the math side of things. Or It's hard to explain what you don't understand, but we can't have deep conversations about the household stuff that needs doing. So it's all on my shoulders. 
the way I explain it to people, I feel like I'm hanging off a cliff by one finger and I'm like that. And I'm just holding on by that. But... It's t- hard. We used to make the decisions together. Yeah. And that, uh, and basically rely on each other for the help. And now I think Lee feels, as he said, that he makes all the decisions now. It's all left for him to, to do. And I don't like that sometimes because then... Sometimes I have to say to her, no, we can't do this because of this. And then it upsets her because I don't understand why we can't do it. And then I feel like the bad guy because I've made the decision and stuff like that. It's just, it's very hard to get used to. But one thing that stayed, and I'm grateful for this really, is our love for each other. And as I keep, as I said earlier, Claire's getting better and better as the months roll on. And it's just very... We didn't realise, no. you, you didn't either, how long the process it's Like I said, if someone breaks their leg, comes out of hospital, they get told six weeks in a cast, your leg's fine. Yeah. It doesn't seem to be any end thing in sight at the moment, and that's the hard thing, is not knowing. My brain just does not stop ticking at the moment. I just... And it's always one thing after the other, yeah. isn't it? And I just feel exhausted, mentally drained. Like I just want it to stop. Sometimes I feel like I just need someone to sit me down and say, right, this is what we're doing, this is what's happening, so I don't make any decisions. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's it's very, very hard. And, and that, another thing I want to touch on um, is there's so much support, and I agree with this, for the person who's been through it. But on the other side, there is hardly anything for husbands, boyfriends, family. Or even wives, if, if someone's yeah. husband's gone through this. And it's a bit weird to say sometimes. Sometimes I get a bit envious or jealous that Claire's the one with the illness because she's getting the doctors and she's getting their community nurses come round and here's the medication and... In a way, she's getting the support from me and other people. And I sit there. And it does sound really selfish because I do sit there and think, hello, I'm here, what about me? Sometimes. But I've also then got to remember this woman's waking up in pain every morning. This woman just to get out of bed. Like, it's heartbreaking sometimes, especially the morning where she's so stiff and all that, just to see the way she wobbles and all that. But... She could sit there and just lay in bed all the time and say, I'm not doing nothing. Just give me my meds, give me my food, I'm watching TV. But she gets herself up every day, sets herself a goal every day, a little target every day. So as much as it is hard for me, it must be 10 times as hard for her as well. But what I find heartbreaking in is to have to sit back and watch the person you love go through it. Oh, you're making me. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get emotional. So, is there anything else you want to say before we wrap this up? I just want to say I could not have got through it without this man. Uh, Honestly, I, I say this all the time, and he hates it. But he, yeah, but I'm not going through it. Has been my. We are. We're both going through it. Not exactly. just me. It's you as well. And the kids. And the kids. They have been my rock. They were my rock for that seven weeks. You really trust me. My they... son and my daughter will not know how much they kept me together when this woman was in hospital. If it wasn't for them, I don't know. If I was on my own and didn't have children and go through this, I don't know how I would have coped. So, and he has been a rock. He went, he ran a household, he went to work, he was coming up to see me, he was then listening to what was going on with me, he was then running a house, and that, he, and uh, worrying about me, anxiety about me, he was, that was like that for seven weeks, like, curiously at that, weren't it? And then even when I come home. Even now still, like, you uh, do as much as you can, but. Yeah, there's little bits that I'm like, I can't, or I need help with. And he's still like it. And there's no, not no, there's no help, but there's like, we both said that we needed counselling. And he went before me, he applied before I did. And within weeks, I got 
an answer back and I was like, yeah, bam, on the list, speaking to someone. And then Lee is still waiting and hasn't got his first therapy thing till, what, this weekend? Tomorrow. Yeah. Tomorrow, yeah. So it's like, so what? It's been a year since these things happened. Yeah, and he still has to go to work every day, put on a brave face. And I know, because I know Lee like the back of my hand, he's broken inside emotionally, physically, mentally. And he needs... Just go and have a good beer, really. <laughs> <laughs> God, can you imagine a pub? You drink it all. But we want to thank you for taking the time out to listen to our story. Please get in contact, like leave a comment or message us or whatever if you've got any questions or need any support. Please uh, give to the Stroke Awareness uh, charity as well because, as we said before, Stroke is not a laughing matter and it's not an old person's illness. It's just that's what and you And don't hear. ever think that it can't happen to you. Um, also, if there's any diabetic charities in the UK, please give to them as well, the Heart Foundation. And King's College Hospital. Yep. You might have had bad experience, but honestly, the nurses and doctors there, they were amazing. We were going through a pandemic at the time and they would have had friends in that hospital that had seen or even themselves would have been on the ICU COVID wards and would have seen the traumatic scenes that COVID had brought, but they still uh, treated Claire like she mattered. So big up the NHS staff completely. Hate the hospital managers, hate the politicians, <laughs> but the nurses themselves. If there's any NHS tra charities as well, please donate too as well. Uh, thanks for your time. And uh, maybe, now. yeah, maybe six months we'll do a, an update video. Yeah. So. Uh, um, thank you. And well, thank to this you. Man. <laughs> and uh, thanks for watching, guys. Take care. Speak to you soon.